I just only managed to do it now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, we're doping it becomes superconducting, and the most. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, um, okay. And uh, there are uh, many puzzling features about uh, superconductivity in transient magnet, and I'm uh, not going to go into any of those details. So hopefully, not I'm not going to say things which are controversial. Uh, but then, no. okay. Um, but why why do we care about uh, uh, transverse optical phonons? Um, so. Uh, this plot uh, shows you uh, how the transverse optical phonon is softening with the density. And this black line, this is telling you uh, Fermi energy. So if you, uh, if you want to use some sort of phonon mechanism for the superconductivity, uh, there are options up there. We can try to use them. But the problem is then the phonon uh, frequency is much higher than the Fermi, Fermi energy. So either you can use some, uh, you have to use some. Uh, anti adiabatic theory uh, for superconductivity. Uh, the other option is uh, uh, maybe this transverse optical phonon that is softening, that is uh, the main driver of superconductivity. Um, and there are uh, some reasons uh, why uh, one should think about that. Uh, partly because uh, the superconductivity shows a very BCS like feature where uh, gap to TC ratio follows uh, this BCS. Uh, <coughs> Prediction. Um, so that sort of gives an indication that maybe uh, try, not trying to use these anti adiabatic limits and still trying to use uh, these uh, adiabatic limits where you can still justify some sort of weak coupling picture uh, is a better approach. Um, so, um, as I said, uh, I'm just going to talk about some general uh, consideration for with this TO phonon mechanism. And I'll just mention. Uh, that this sort of uh, quantum critical, quantum critical by I mean the TO phonon that is becoming uh, soft, uh, that was, uh, at least in my knowledge, uh, in STO was first pointed out by Sasha. Uh, well, they, uh, but uh, that particular, the, the way they were uh, using it, I think that was a bit, uh, that, that didn't, doesn't really give enough uh, Electron phonon coupling strength to really justify it. It's not really. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, was, I was not going to say the second line. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, why, why, why TO phonon is a bit tricky is uh, like if you start with a single electronic band and then try to, pair, uh, try to introduce some electron phonon coupling where phi is my phonon mode and this H bar is some extra term that couples with the the couples electronic and phonon degree. Um, since the TO phonon, uh, it's polar, breaks inversion symmetry. So I want this to be odd under inversion. But at the same time, the entire system has an inversion symmetry. For To keep the entire electron phonon uh, coupling, uh, you need the other part to be uh, odd as well. But since this is just a scalar function, uh, this is not compatible with time reversal symmetry. Um, then there is a simple resolution uh, to that is uh, you can either use some sort of spin orbit coupling because then you, you're not restricted with some scalar function. And then there's the more recently pointed out that you can also use multi orbital physics, uh, which is actually, uh, uh, in a way, uh, it, it's very natural to think about it. And I'm actually going to talk about something uh, in more, uh, related to this with a small extension to uh, the arguments in this paper. Um, so if you, uh, and uh, this paper mostly talks about spinless scenario. Uh, so, uh, and if you start with like some sort of, let's say you start with two orbitals uh, without any spin, uh, then time reversal now dictates that uh, the polymetric coefficient uh, which comes in front of polymetrics two should be odd. Um, and then, uh, so uh, uh, a physical picture would be something like this. You can imagine something like a px orbitals and py orbital. And uh, so that's your two orbitals, there's no spin. Um, 
And uh, if I want to introduce some electron phonon coupling, even from this picture, it becomes sort of obvious that uh, an interorbital coupling uh, breaks inversion symmetry. So you can, you can bring an inversion symmetric uh, functions that are uh, proportional to polymetric two, but are even functions. Uh, sorry, but, but are odd functions. And then you can still satisfy the end, or, overall inversion symmetry of the system. Why, why don't you have the gradient of the Oh, that's uh, put in this part. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, just to uh, mention that uh, you can also consider a scenario where uh, the two orbitals that are involved have different parity themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are P orbitals, both are inversion odd by themselves. We can have an SNP, so one is inversion odd and one is inversion here. Uh, and but but the the point is that you can write very some very simple coupling that is symmetry allowed uh, without invoking spin order coupling. Um, but this may be the may not be the most physical scenario to uh, consider superconductivity. Uh, part is uh, doesn't have spin, so either in that case you have some like single Fermi surface uh, without spin. So either that superconductivity is really interesting or not interesting at all because it probably doesn't exist. Uh, the uh, other scenario, uh, and if you just restrict in the skin less case, then the other option is you go in some sort of multi-band feature uh, where there are two bands on the Fermi surface or you are close to some sort of Dirac crossings, which uh, this uh, paper focuses. And I don't, uh, uh, but a more general scenario is to consider both spin and orbital. Uh, so then you have an upspin block, you have a downspin block, and both of them uh, have your two orbitals involved. Um, uh, yeah, so going, and I'm going to take the same example of PX and PY orbital. Um, so now I just modified my uh, Hamilton, electronic Hamiltonian by putting a spin label on top of what was there. Uh, now, the important point here is that uh, the time reversal now flips the spin. So it will take spin up sector to spin down sector. Uh, and inversion symmetry, at least for these sort of orbitals, uh, make, uh, uh, puts a constraint that this should be an even function of k. Um, then my claim is that this term H2S that I, uh, I put in, which at this level looks like it's not a spin orbit coupling because it uh, has a spin label with it, but it's the most general allowed spin orbit term in this uh, in these kind of system. Uh, one way you can think it's a spin orbit term is because uh, the upspin and downspin blocks have a different sign size of the spin. Um, so, what you can start is, let's say you have a spin up part, you have a spin down part, and you can try to put uh, some general uh, off diagonal term as a spin orbit term. And it turns out if you have to satisfy inversion and time reversal, this is the only off diagonal term. Uh, and I can always just make global spin rotation uh, from, let's say, starting spin quantization axis along Z to some in plane quantization axis. And bring that off diagonal spin orbit term as a sigma two uh, or tau two polymetrics that takes opposite sign in the two dots. Uh, so that basically says uh, even if you have spin orbit coupling, you're just effectively doing this with two dots or two by two. Uh, the only difference is that uh, the this sigma two polymetric comes with a different sign. The other thing also is you can see that the, uh, the bands are degenerate in the upper block and the lower block. Um, so uh, now based on that, uh, again, you can take the same uh, in, uh, inversion case. You can also take um, orbitals, which uh, one of which changes sign and, and the inversion, one of the other one doesn't change sign in the inversion. Uh, and then uh, put this electron phonon coupling. And uh, so this is a uh, uh, complicated equation to explain, but uh, I'm just going to I just wrote it just to show that <laughs> this is something you can get as a more, most generic spin or uh, electron phonon coupling that you can uh, put for the system. Uh, important thing is uh, this uh, electron phonon vertex doesn't change uh, spin during a scattering, even if you represent spin in this uh, spin rotated basis, uh, so that you diagonalize your uh, Hamiltonian in the uh, in the spin part. Uh, and then these vertex functions, uh, these big gammas, they have uh, 
order A1 symmetry, depending on which of the combination of orbital you take. Uh, um, yeah, so now, uh, and, and, and basically then essentially says that, uh, so you start with some sort of, you have spin and orbit. So you have, uh, you might have a Fermi surface with, uh, you might have four Fermi surfaces, uh, but each, uh, you can always assign a spin label to them. Uh, but then uh, you can always tune, let's say, uh, H1 term. Remember, H1 was not the spin order term. And uh, the reduced, uh, let's say, inner Fermi surface, that you're only left with two Fermi surfaces. Uh, so per spin, you still have only one Fermi surface. So you're not, in principle, you're also not doing some sort of multi band physics. It's still a single band physics. Uh, but the only important thing is that the Fermi surface itself has. Uh, sectors that are coming from different orbitals. Uh, so then what electron phonon coupling does is that, let's say it scatters an electron from, let's say, a PY sector, some PX sector. And these are, uh, this is really the most general term you can introduce at, at the first order of coupling with transverse optical phonon. Uh, so eventually it turns out the multi-orbital is the necessary and sufficient condition. The orbit is not required. If you want spin orbit, you need multi orbit to begin with. Uh, but you can have just multi orbit, no spin orbit, and you can easily couple these. Uh, now, uh, just uh, as uh, I want, uh, I motivated that I want to say some things about superconductivity. And in particular, I just want to say uh, what we can expect in terms of order parameters for these kind of superconductivity. Uh, if you uh, you don't need spin orbit coupling, uh, but if you have spin orbit coupling, uh, that's all. You need multi orbital. That's the main thing. Uh, multi orbital in the sense that your Fermi surface should have sectors coming off from different. If we compute the element, that's fine. You can then, then there will be spin Yeah. Uh, even if you have spin orbit coupling, uh, if you write your Hamiltonian in the rotated spin basis, the electron column vertex spinning uh, independent. Okay. Uh, it's just it, it chooses a spin quantization axis, but that's all it does. Oh, um, just to motivate that, uh, even if you have this, this yeah. Um, yeah. So, and and the fact that I was saying the vertex really doesn't flip the spin if you write your spin in this uh, rotated basis. Uh, uh, you can just uh, split uh, your uh, electron, electron, in fact, your electron, electron, electron diagram into uh, the same spin and the opposite spin interaction. And they don't, uh, they are completely decoupled, at least at uh, this level of scale. Uh, and then you can just uh, take the same spin pairs and opposite spins pairs separately, even in the presence of spin orbit coupling. Um, so now if I uh, look at the opposite spin uh, pair, uh, there's often people do is uh, sort of just describe at least a linearized gap equation, just split that into spin triplet and spin singlet part, uh, which is not strictly true if you have spin orbit coupling. Even in this case, uh, the reason was uh, even if I could diagonalize into spin blocks, the, uh, the block Hamiltonian was uh, different. So the block wave vectors for this spin and the opposite spin are slightly different. So in general, uh, if you just look at, let's say, opposite spin sector, then your uh, spin singlet and triplet, they are uh, coupled the equations that you should solve. Um, but you can just stay here, uh, stay at this level, and not, uh, don't do this decomposition and just solve the single gap equation. Um, right. Uh, and then uh, once you project uh, this electron phonon interaction, now, uh, it's the same interaction that I wrote in the beginning. I just, I'm just projecting it over the band basis. Uh, so C R is this by chi, and uh, the vertex function is based on the new vertex function. The only thing, uh, uh, well, what I'm going to say, the most important thing for that is because of the time reversal symmetry, uh, this vertex function has uh, this condition where flipping the spin and the momentum and taking a complex conjugate, you go back to the same. And then doing some bunch of algebra, uh, you can show that the linearized gap equation 
takes uh, some form like this. Now, <laughs> this form is not that effective, except for uh, noticing that uh, there's uh, the matrix. Uh, so in the linearized gap equation, we're usually just diagonalizing matrix to find the uh, uh, superconduct uh, electron phonon couplings and uh, superconducting C. Um, what the only thing uh, we should care about is that this part here has entries which are all positive, uh, all non-negative entries. Uh, so then you're trying to diagonalize uh, to uh, find PC. We are trying to diagonalize gap equations which have only non-negative entries. Uh, so that says number one that there is always BCS instability, at least at this level, without including electron-electron -electron interaction, uh, because you can always find finite PC. Uh, the other thing it says is highest PC gap function has even parity. Uh, that comes from a theorem in uh, matrix diagonalization. Um, it can have uh, zeros. So there is a possibility that you can construct a, a gap function that has even parity, but not necessarily S wave. So you can construct D wave, but I couldn't really come up with a simple model that could give me D wave as more than S wave. Um, so that was when I was talking about uh, opposite spin channel. Uh, I can go into the same spin channel and I can do something similar. The difference here is uh, once I come to the gap equation, I get this function, which is not mod square, it's just square, and this uh, can take complex entries. So now you're, you're diagonalizing a Hamiltonian, uh, uh, not sorry, uh, you're diagonalizing a matrix uh, that may take uh, uh, that may take values which are uh, negative. And uh, just uh, to get this form, I use inversion symmetry, just to see. And so that says on top of that, that if even if you look in the same spin channel, PC will always be less than the opposite spin channel because uh, for every entry of this matrix, there is a absolute value of that entry for the gap equation in the opposite spin channel. So it will always be bounded by uh, that particular PC. Uh, and then uh, final point is that the only way to get around that and get an odd parity superconductivity is that it's still some sort of electron electron repulsion. And uh, just to give an example, if you put something like uh, local Hubbard, that gives a term in the, uh, in the entries of the matrix that goes as a minus of a positive number. So whenever uh, this term uh, overpowers this term, you can, in principle, have some C wave sort of superconductivity. Um, just like a couple of minutes to come back to uh, the materials. Uh, so, if you uh, so a lot of the like in terms of like the TO, uh, using TO mode mechanism for STO and KTO, uh, people have uh, other people have considered that as well. And just to tell you uh, the relevance uh, and uh, one point, I don't think uh, which uh, is sort of a preview into uh, the follow-up work is about uh, superconductivity between bulk STO and bulk ATO. So bulk STO is a superconductor. It has a PC of around 4.4 Kelvin. Bulk KTO is not, not a superconductor. Um, but uh, the interfaces of KTO have a superconductivity which is uh, has higher TC than STO. So then it is the question like why then in the bulk KTO is not a superconductor. Um, so uh, one of the reasons that could be uh, is that STO has a weak spin orbit coupling and KTO has a much higher spin orbit coupling, 20 times. Now, I just said that for the electron to your phonon, spin orbit is not really relevant. But the way it is relevant is that if you have a higher spin orbit coupling, so remember, your bands, uh, your, in, in these, uh, you have bands coming from D orbitals. So if you just look at the d orbital belts, they tend to be very anisotropic. But if you put in spin orbit coupling, that sort of smoothens out the anisotropy and your bands become uh, start to become very isotropic with the spin orbit coupling. And then isotropic bands will have, at least in 3D, will have vanishing density of state at uh, low dope On top of that, the TO phonon energy in uh, KTO is about three times larger. So these two factors sort of indicate that if you use this uh, TO phonon mechanism, that kind of 
that may explain why uh, there's this uh, discrepancy between SQ and KTO's productivity. Um, and just, uh, well, I said most of the points here. I, I just, uh, as a conclusion, I'll just say the last point. There's still, an, uh, there's still a question of like quadratic coupling between your follow which can happen in general. Uh, what I considered was a uh, linear coupling where like there's a one phonon exchange. I've heard from people that at least for SPO, the two phonon exchange term is as strong as linear coupling. So that's still something that uh, we need to figure out. Like uh, maybe as a systematic study would be quite useful. Yeah, I'm done with this. Yeah. What was your conclusion about about Tito in in quantum type? Um. So, I uh, what I showed there was no conclusion because what I showed uh, at least for SPO because there was just a general point. Uh, my conclude uh, about the material specific, which is I haven't really shown much, but uh, what we think is that calcium titanate has the best productivity. Uh, potassium uh, one of the difference is that uh, electron geopolon coupling, uh, well, geopolon energy in uh, KTO is three times higher than calcium titanate. So it, that will reduce the effective coupling process. The other thing is uh, because uh, KTO bands are, are more isotropic because of the spin orbit, higher spin orbit coupling. So the higher spin orbit coupling will smoothen out the anisotropy of the orbital band. Uh, so that will reduce the density of state. Uh, so at the big coupling superconductivity, you have density of state and electron photon coupling. Both of these terms are smaller, so it's potassium density and solution density. Uh, so that may explain why uh, one is the energy. I have the impression that the electron photon couplings could be calculated in ab initio calculations nowadays. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to spec yeah, yeah. So that's a, uh, uh, I'm not an initial expert, yeah. but uh, yeah. we have a lot of work uh, where we use some numbers from other that we show. Yeah, I haven't shown it. Uh, so there are, there are two more things. So what I said was about one. Uh, there are things about uh, the other. Uh, the more surprising thing is also that, if you, but if you go in the interface, uh, potassium tensions have higher than uh, So that, that again, uh, there are other reasons, there might be other reasons along with like zero coupling, but also the fact that um, far from the P2G space, G space uh, has higher energy than the P2G that, so that may provide extra particles that are coupled with the P2G. Um, so, yeah, we, uh, of course, you, you don't need to, uh, like, there are like quantitative agreements that seem to make sense. But, uh, I think it's yeah. an unfair question because it's not really that serious. But you chose the face and eyebrow with the box in 18. Uh -huh. How much is known about how those connect? Do we have good studies that charge those things together with box? Um, um, I I have seen some. Uh, I don't know if what I'm going to say is that exactly accurate. Uh, um, I think uh, ECG species, uh, if you go like in the middle axis, you still have a like phase to an extent, but the optimal PC is phase when it's optimal to scale with an optimal But I've seen that. Terms of whether we ever get into positivity in the experiment. Well, there's a Kelly paper uh, by uh, uh, Jonathan Rubin. Uh, I think it's CRL from last year, it's like synergic neural electricity and superconductivity. Uh, but it's a Kelly. <laughs> uh, I have no idea. Like, okay. Uh 
So I, I was saying, you know, uh, because uh, you have a larger scale of recession, so you're, you're starting with, let's say, deorbital bands, right? So deorbital bands are very analytical. They keep it here, right? Then if you put in spin orbit coupling, so that mixes uh, mixes the DXY with DYZ, and that makes it hypertrophic. So that then decreases the density of phase at lower doses. So it's like sort of going from like quasi 2D bands to like a fully isotropic 3D band. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah. So that's that's a uh, that's a important that's a good point. Uh, so the, this argument is specifically for uh, without uh, well, there are no suspension relationship because even for like this when I was introducing the phone coupling. I put a constraint of inversion. So, like, so the, the, that spin orbit coupling that I put in preserve the inversion. Yeah. But like in the interfaces, you have those inversion symmetry. That puts in extra channels of electron phonon coupling that are not in the uh, Yes, but that's not yeah. <laughs> that, uh, There are like extra channels which uh, goes as uh, inversion symmetry broken that uh, parameter attempts. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm still not like 100% sure about uh, all the numbers because eventually, like, uh, because then there are like more banks coming in, it's uh, like more bigger uh, couple of But uh, I think that like, is my uh, my initial, my helpful <laughs> sort of do make sense. Now, by Uno,